Russia's assault on Ukraine is now in its 29th day with a continuous stream of images of destruction and death coming from the outman nation as it puts up a strong but costly fight. In response to the growing humanitarian crisis, President Biden announced today, while in Brussels for emergency talks with NATO, that the U.S. would accept 100,000 refugees fleeing Ukraine out of the 3.6 million that have been displaced so far. Also on Washington's mind, the possibility that Putin might turn his sights on us via a different kind of attack, not one with traditional military means, but aimed instead at essential economic and technological systems, as the White House warned earlier this week. One of the tools he's most likely to use, in my view, in our view, is a cyber, cyber attacks. They have a very sophisticated cyber capability. The magnitude of Russia's cyber capacity is fairly consequential, and it's coming. The federal government is doing its part to get ready. There's still much more we need to do to have the confidence that we've locked our digital doors, particularly for the critical services Americans rely on. So what exactly would a Russian cyber attack on the U.S. look like, and how should big companies and institutions and maybe ordinary people respond? I'm joined now by Lauren Zabrick, executive director of the Cyber Project at Harvard's Kennedy, pardon me, Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, and Michael Siegel, director of cybersecurity at MIT's Sloan School of Management. Thank you both for being here. Lauren, to my ear, those comments from President Biden suggest that a cyber attack is either highly likely or inevitable. Do you share that assessment? You know, I think where the president is telling us that this is a credible threat and, and trailing, you know, the, the entire United States looking at the different uh, private sector organizations, critical infrastructure, things like that, then yes, there is credibility to that threat. And of course, when we think of a threat, we think of intent plus capability. And so what he's saying is we already know the capability exists. So what he's likely saying is that the intent is actually starting to materialize. Uh, Michael, what is your assessment? Oh, well, very good. I, I, I agree that the, the capability is very much there. But realizing in cyber attack, we have the word attack. And I do uh, have uh, some amount of, uh, I think there must be some amount of caution with the idea of an actual attack of the United States. So up to this point, we've had the, the Russians attack the Ukraine, we've had sanctions, but an actual attack on the US, though a cyber attack, might be considered very differently. So I, I agree strongly that the capability is there. Um, I'm just not sure that we know we know the, or have a full understanding of the consequences of an attack. Well, let's try to talk through some of those right now. My sense, and I, I am not an expert at all, unlike the two of you, but my understanding is that Russia, prior to the war in Ukraine, uh, did some work disabling the Ukrainian power system. Am I getting that correct? What are some of the things that if an attack did occur here in the US, what might we see? What might that mean in practice? And Lauren, you can start and then we can hear from Michael. Sure, well, you know, attacks, cyber attacks happen every day. And I think that we in this community need to do a much better job at communicating what that actually means to the public. So I think for a public, they think, they hear attack and they think perhaps active war. And that's not what we're talking about here. We see so much activity in the cyber domain, millions of attacks per day against our businesses, our government infrastructure, and things like that. And so, you know, there are, I think, a couple of different flavors that this could potentially take. Now, whether such an attack would reach the threshold of war, that's what we don't know. And so when we say threshold of war, we're talking things like significant loss of life, significant injury or harm, um, significant disabling of our critical infrastructure or really essential services and our public safety systems, things like that. That's what I uh, find myself, and I'm very much a catastrophic thinker, so I always imagine the worst. Coupling that with ignorance is probably not a good recipe, but I imagine waking up one morning and not having running water in my home, or not having power, or not being able to access my bank account. Michael, are those uh, overheated imaginings on my part, or are those within the realm of possibility? Well, again, with regard to capability, I certainly think they're in the realm of possibility. With regard of when you cross the line, that's the question you have to ask. 
Russia has for many years had many, uh, I would say, sanctioned groups which have, you know, committed major attacks against the United States, against corporations in the United States. And the energy system, for example, has been probed. And recently they reported, you know, several probes of the, the energy, uh, several energy system networks. So the capability is there. The, the issue is, and, and Belfer Center has certainly done a lot of excellent work on this with regard to, to policy and understanding when cyber can become an act of war. The real question is, when do you cross that line? So if you, you send a few of your uh, sanctioned organizations to maybe shut down a business here or shut down a business there, you probably get away with it. You know, it makes front page, it, you know, probably gets associated with, you know, Putin, associated with Russia, but um, it may not cross the line. If you start to cut off energy, electricity, so on and so forth, I, I think you start to cross a line and... Uh, that that's that's when we don't know what happens. That's when we don't know. Uh, Lauren, what is your assessment of what the people who run the systems that we rely on? And I know there's uh, you know more of them than I can even start to name here. What's your assessment of how seriously they are taking this threat and whether they're doing the things right now that they should be to brace for potentially disruptive worst case scenarios? Well, I think it's important to remember that most of the organizations that run these services are in the private sector. So that's one thing that we need to keep in mind. And that has a whole host of considerations for things like you know, international humanitarian law and law of armed conflict and things like that. Um, but you know, as far as what they're trying, what they're doing, you know, to to secure these systems, you know, cybersecurity is a long game. It's a long-term investment. And while it, it is true, we do not have regulations for cybersecurity, you know, across these sectors, except, you know, maybe for the, the energy sector, I will say what we've seen in the last couple of weeks, even the last year, you know, after the administration has taken, uh, has come into, um, you know, to the government and, you know, put into place people um, like Ann Newberg or like Director Jen Easterly, like Director Chris Inglis from the National Cyber Director, you know, there's a real focus on trying to improve the state of our cybersecurity across our nation. And so we've seen a lot of um, advisories, joint advisories from CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, from FBI, you know, warning companies and really trying to push them to work together, work with the government, share information and back and forth, right? From the government to the private sector and from the private sector to the government. And I think we've seen a lot of uh, progress there. And, you know, I, where they've put out the, the Shields Up advisories, I think that organizations are taking them very seriously. It's just, you know, again, are, are we making those long-term investments, but are, also are we making more short-term things too, things like strong random passwords across accounts and multi-factor authentication and things like that. That's actually a perfect transition to another thing I wanted to ask both of you about, which is what, if any, agency ordinary people can exercise if this threat or this array of threats is looming on the horizon. It makes you want to do something, but I'm not a systems administrator. I'm just, you know, a guy who works at WGBH and, and you know, I'm on email sometimes, I'm on Twitter sometimes. Michael, what can average people do to ramp up their own security in a moment like this? What should we do? Well, I do think people, if we, if security becomes thought part of our thought process and part of our sort of daily activities, if we, we do sign on for two-factor authentication and do those types of things that are recommended to us, I think it strengthens us as a whole. So I don't, I think that's a good, you know, a, a, a good starting point um, for things. Uh, you know, to some extent, you know, we we also should think about what happens to some extent, if if the electricity goes off and what happens, and so, to you know, we we may want to be prepared. Some people may want to be prepared if they have difficult access to medicines or difficult access to things that might be affected by a uh, an outage or whatever. They may want to prepare for that to some extent because preparing for cybersecurity is not just prevention and detection; it's also response. So. Even as individuals, we have to have a way to respond to some shortage or something that might occur. 
I also want to mention just one thing. I, I, I think it's important to realize, I, I think the, the government has done an excellent job. I've worked a lot with the energy sector. I, I think there's a lot of preparation that has been put in place. Um, the, uh, our people are very talented. Uh, there's a lot of skills. But when it comes right down to it, cybersecurity is asymmetric warfare. You need only one access point. Yeah. The, 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 the threat actor needs one place to get in. And you, and as a company or as an energy sector or whatever, we need to protect every access point. And so that's that's a difficult job for a defender. And ultimately, we not only want to defend, but we want, and just as you ask on a personal level, we want to be able to respond or react yeah. to things that occur. Lauren, we want you got, our tabletop exercises and we want to be able to do things. Yes. Lauren, you got the last word here, just in about 20 seconds. Are there things ordinary people should do to be safe or be prepared? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, we're all vulnerable, right, in the digital realm. And so things like, as I mentioned, having strong random passwords across all of your accounts, having something like multi-factor authentication, regularly updating your software and your devices. And of course, remember that phishing where yes. someone sends you a link or, or an attachment is still the number one attack vector. So don't click on those links or, or open those attachments when you don't know where they come from. Thank you for that. I will now update my iPhone after we finish this interview. Uh, Lauren Zabrook and Michael Siegel, thank you both. Thank, thank you. you.